This video was sponsored by CuriosityStream, in partnership with my streaming service, Nebula. Hey, happy Friday! This week, LG introduced a promising new technology for foldable displays, MediaTek over to Qualcomm in a big way, and Facebook and Ray-Ban announced a new pair of smart sunglasses that you should almost definitely not buy. We also made a hardcore edition quiz this week, which means we collected the most difficult questions from our last 20 quizzes and put them into a single quiz. So if you like a good challenge, check it out in the link below and welcome to the Friday checkout. Okay, my release highlights this week start with the Google Series 1 Desk, which is a $2,000 Chrome OS running machine that can do three things. One, it is a video conferencing machine built for Google Meet with eight microphones and a special webcam that can track you around. Two, it is also a 27 inch collaborative whiteboard with a touchscreen and pen support. And three, it can also be turned into a simple monitor if you plug in a laptop. Pretty cool. After that, Amazon announced that they have officially started making TVs now. They are unsurprisingly powered by Alexa and the Fire TV platform. They're sold under the Omni and Fire TV brands, and they start with eight different models because, of course, Amazon just has to make every product under the sun themselves. And finally, I am telling you, Android tablets are making a comeback, with Realme this week announcing their first one ever, the Realme Pad, Lenovo and TCL announcing two each, and Xiaomi bringing their Mi Pad 5 to Europe, starting with Belarus for some weird reason. Anyway, it's crazy that all of these manufacturers basically ignored the category for many, many years, and they apparently all just got the memo at the same time, and they just all got to making tablets. To see all of the new releases, including prices and details, Details, check the release monitor in the crowd app, links are in the description. Okay, and my first story of the week will be LG Chem announcing a new type of display cover for foldable screens. So this is basically the transparent layer that goes on top of the OLED screen itself. LG said that they used PET instead of ultra thin glass, which most people will probably know from plastic bottles, and they covered it with a special but undisclosed layer on both sides, which is supposedly going to make it both more scratch resistant and less prone to showing creases when compared to current folding displays. To the point where LG says that this layer would be tough enough to enable outward folding foldable and rollable displays place as well, where the screen is permanently exposed to the environment. A very bold claim. And it is supposed to come to market in 2023, so not far from now. And based on my research, there seems to be basically three main materials that are used as kind of display covers for foldable screens. First, ultra-thin glass made by Germany-based Schott and US-based Corning, which is what's used on, for example, Samsung foldables. Second, there are colorless polyamides made by a Korean company called Colon Industries, which is used on almost all of the Chinese foldables, like the Xiaomi Mi Mix Fold, the Huawei Mate X, Moto Razr, and the ThinkPad X1. And third, there is now PET. Now, I'm not a chemist or a material scientist, so I'm not going to make any grand claims here, but here's the basics that I could find out about these. Polyamides, as far as I can tell, don't seem to crack, and at least on the ThinkPad X1, they seem to be tough enough to actually handle pen input as well. But research firm UBI actually expected them to only be used in large displays over 10 inches in the future, or budget models, while ultra-thin glass, at least before LG's announcement, was projected to take up the lion's share in the next few years. I have no idea why, but glass seems to be the better tech overall. Now, we don't know how good LG's PET solution will be, but as a reminder, Samsung actually already uses their own pre-applied PET screen protector on top of their ultra-thin glass on the Fold and Flip 3 that keeps them from cracking, and the 80% increase in durability of their screens this year over the Fold 2 that allowed them to add the S Pen is apparently all thanks to the improvements of the PET screen protector, so Samsung too is kind of at least partially betting on the toughening up of their PET solution as well. So to my non-expert brain, it doesn't seem like a crazy idea that LG could just toughen up their PET to a point where they could basically skip the glass layer underneath. And from what I could read, that would probably also make everything cheaper because it's just plastic. So we'll have to wait and see how that goes. Okay, and my second story of the week will be big shifts in the mobile SoC market. 
According to Counterpoint, MediaTek in particular had a fantastic time almost doubling their market share from last year, reaching 43% and becoming easily the biggest vendor by overtaking Qualcomm, who lost a little bit of market share overall. Apple basically stayed stable in place 3. Unisoc more than doubled their market share to 9% and actually overtook Samsung's Exynos line for the first time ever, which fell back to 5th place. And of course, Huawei's high silicon unit had an absolutely disastrous year. In terms of 5G basebands, Qualcomm actually dominated, in part because they not only put theirs into their own high-end chips, but also the iPhone chips. MediaTek made some respectable gains too, and again, Samsung and Huawei had a really rough year. And there are a couple of main takeaways and trends that I can see here. First, Samsung's big claims about Exynos being back, well, those didn't really work out. The chips themselves are better than last year's, but still not quite beating Qualcomm. And not only are Samsung's phone sales down, they also outsourced many of their low-end phones to Chinese ODMs, who mostly used the non-Exynos chips. So Exynos really suffered. Apparently next year, Verizon is rumored to want an Exynos version of the S22 for the first time ever in the US, and the new AMD partnership should kick in next year as well, so maybe they can turn things around, but we just don't know yet. Second, apparently one of the big reasons why MediaTek managed to gain so much ground on Qualcomm was that they were less constrained on the supply chain side than Qualcomm was, and apparently that should kind of fix itself in the next few quarters for Qualcomm, so the balance should kind of tip back a little bit. And third, Unisoc really seems to be on a roll with their entry-level chips gaining a bunch of customers on the low end like Nokia, Realme, Motorola, and Micromax. But their success is also really surprising given that their parent company literally just declared bankruptcy this summer. Tsinghua Unigroup is a partially state-owned enterprise from China and a subsidiary of the Tsinghua University, and it was propped up by the government pumping huge sums of money into it until they basically decided that this was no longer financially worth it. A company that is supposed to be in major financial distress more than doubling their market share year over year is not something that I've ever seen before, I think. So I really wonder if Unisoc can actually keep up this massive growth or if they will crumble soon after. Anyway, and my last story will be a quick one and it is going to be Facebook's brand new smart glasses that they launched in collaboration with Ray-Ban. These are called the Ray-Ban Stories. They don't have any AR built into them, just two cameras, speakers, a touch sensitive side and voice controls. They look pretty much exactly like normal sunglasses otherwise and they are only 5 grams heavier, which is really impressive. And based on the first reviews that I could find, they seem to take pretty okay photos and videos too, including some depth effects that is supposedly not entirely trash. To use them, Facebook has actually built a separate app called Facebook View, so you can share your photos to not only Facebook and Instagram and whatever. They actually don't seem terrible as a product, but of course the only problem is that they're made by potentially two of the most comically evil companies on Earth. Now, Facebook you of course already know, but Luxotica, the company that actually owns Ray-Ban, the brand, if you don't know about them, I've linked to a documentary down in the description, but basically they are like as if Monopoly Man, the caricature, turned into a real company. That's Luxotica in a nutshell. Now, if you are the type that actually likes documentaries, which I bet you are since you're watching my videos, then check out CuriosityStream. It is the best place online to watch thousands of high-quality professional documentaries on technology, science, history, nature, and more, like my latest favorite, Engineering the Future, for example. This is a super well-produced documentary series covering various forms of renewable energy, flying taxis, and all of the other wild stuff in much greater detail than a regular YouTube video could, and CuriosityStream has a lot more like it. The service got started by the founder of the Discovery Channel. They have legendary hosts like David Attenborough, Jane Goodall, Stephen Hawking, and more. And if you use my link to sign up, you'll also get free access to our very own streaming service, Nebula, which is built and owned by some of YouTube's best educational creators. Nebula has exclusive originals, for example, The Unknown City by Neo, which is one of the most beautiful visualizations I've ever seen online of the scale of the refugee crisis. I will be releasing my own Nebula 
original very soon too. Plus we have all of our regular content there too, of course ad free without any tracking and in the case of my tech alter videos even a day or two early. The two services combined cost only 15 bucks for an entire year so you can support us and get great content for a very reasonable price. Check it out, links are in the description and I'll see you next week.